Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. Hi, Jacob. Henry Ford seems like a great guy. Yeah. I was aware that he was personally anti-Semitic. I did not know before doing this research what a, how influential he was um, in like a seminal role. Like nobody else was playing the kind of role he was internationally in fomenting the worst of it. I have lots of questions about all that and, and we'll get to all of that. But um, I want to say a couple things first. Uh, I feel very grateful to be here with you and thank you so much for asking me to be here. Um, Likewise. I've never been in this scenario with you before. I've always been on television with you as the interviewee or mm -hmm. as the correspondent in the field. This is slightly weird uh, <laughs> to be honest with you. We'll um, be back right after the break. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> when they tell me in my ear when I'm on with Rachel, rap, rap. Um, I, I just want them to know, you know this, there's nothing like, work, as a television correspondent and as, and as a journalist, there is nothing like working with you and being on your show. And I remember from the very first day, the first time I was ever on television with you, it's like seared in my memory. I can close my eyes and remember exactly where I was standing. <laughs> I was in the field house in Iowa City at the university on caucus night um, 2016. And there were all these different preference groups of people and Hillary Clinton's people were over there and Bernie Sanders people were over there and there were no people for Martin O'Malley, poor Martin O'Malley. <laughs> and I was so nervous. Um, but somehow through the television, you made it feel uh, okay, you made me realize you can take a deep breath, you can get nerdy, you can get deep, you can tell this story, and whether it has been covering democracy with you or family separation or whatever the story might be, um, I and I and I ask anybody who's on Rachel's show, you walk away feeling yourself as the interviewee um, smarter and better oh. and like you've learned something. Uh, and so, and the book made me feel the same way. So I just want to say thank you so much for that. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I say on behalf of everybody here, we miss you Tuesday through Friday. <laughs> um, there's a question. Watch this space. Yeah. Yes, exactly. No, yeah, yeah. Do you miss us? <laughs> Okay, so thank you. That's very, very, very kind of you. Um, listen, I have the best job in the world. I have editorial freedom to cover what I want. I do not have to cover stuff I don't want, and I get to cover it the way that I want to as long as I stay within NBC standards. It's the best job in the world. I work with the best team. I get fantastic support. My colleagues are people like Jacob Soboroff. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an excellent, excellent gig. And doing 10 or 12 hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year for 15 years, started to kill me. Um, I, know that, I know what I look like. I'm actually only 14, <laughs> which is, uh, <laughs> um, and I was just, I was, it's not exactly burnout, like I was feeling like I was like kind of grinding out. Um, and I was, I was honestly not going to do this work anymore. I felt like I had just, I was hurting myself and I was not going to be able to do it. And um, I'm very, very grateful to NBC um, that what they came back to me with was, well, we would like you not to quit. Um, and can we think of some different ways for you to do this work? And can we try some things? And I said, I would be very happy to try some things. And let's, 
I ask for three things. Number one, I want all my staff to keep their jobs. Number two, I want fluidity. I want to be able to try a few different things because I think whatever we try first probably won't work. And remember, I was going to do like hiatus and then three days a week and then five days a week and then another short hiatus and then I'm back seven days a week. Like I had this <laughs> complicated thing that we that didn't work. Um, and then the third thing that I asked for was forgiveness. I inevitably, I will screw up and there will be something that goes wrong with this process or it won't work in some way. But please, like, give me, give me a second chance, whatever first goes wrong. And through that very generous um, negotiation with NBC, we ended up where I'm, I think, in a place where I can now do this work for a long time. So I, <laughs> so. Good, good. I will be there every Monday night. I will be there every time a president gets indicted. <laughs> I will be there. <laughs> I mean, there is one former president that was arrested, what, four times in like four months? It, it happens. I'll be there. I'll okay. be there. I'll right. be there primary nights and debate nights and big, big, big nights. And, and, and hopefully with this kind of a schedule, with me able to work on different kinds of deadlines and different kinds of projects and not do five days a week, I am hoping that I can do this for a long time. And you guys, I, I, you won't be able to miss me. You'll be sick of me before you can miss me. <laughs> good. good, 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 good. Um, before, we, um, before we get into the book, uh, tomorrow you have a show. Yeah. And you're doing it from here in LA, I think, right? Yep. Great. Great. Um, I, you know, I think we have to address the news of the day, and, and you, for the last two weeks, all of us, we have been watching so closely um, the war between Israel and Hamas, yeah. and, and you and I have colleagues over there on the ground um, bringing us the story from the ground. You're telling the story from here. Um, can, can you just let us in a little bit on how you... Rachel as the person, and Rachel as the journalist, and Rachel as the, the gatekeeper of information. Hmm. How are you approaching this moment? Well, there's a, uh, there's a couple different things um, that might not be obvious, aside from the obvious. I mean, the, the first is that I feel like there's, the, the disinformation problem is so bad right now. And um, it's not just um, misinformation, meaning like you can, the mnemonic I always use is misinformation is a mistake, um, meaning it's not something that is intended to deceive you, but it might. A lot of misinformation circulates just because people don't have easy ways to verify the information that they are circulating. There's also a lot of disinformation there, which is the mnemonic there is for me dystopia, which is somebody is trying to make you believe false information for a reason. And both of those things are out of control right now, particularly around this conflict. And so that makes me feel like our, I mean, you use the word gatekeeper. It's not, it's kind of gatekeeper. I mean, essentially just being trustworthy. Yeah. Um, the role of being trustworthy and making sure that we are abiding by news making, or by, by news gathering standards. Um, is really important. And I would, I don't mean to say this in a self-serving way, but when you're looking at news and information, particularly breaking news and information from the region during this war, check to see whose information it is. And check to see what they are showing you and being transparent about in terms of the sourcing. Is the source named? Is the source characterized? Is the source somebody who is in a position to know that of which they purportedly speak? If this is something about a government having decided something, or a court having decided something, or a spokesperson having said something, is there a link to that document? And does that link appear to be real? These sorts of things are always important. This is sort of basic media literacy right now, but I feel very lucky to be at NBC yeah. right now, which is an entity that knows what it's doing and that is a real news organization and takes this stuff really seriously. When you're at a, a, a big, credible news organization, you're not always going to be first, but you are held accountable for being right. And that means correcting yourself when you are inevitably sometimes wrong. And I just, there are not very many of us in jobs like this, at companies like this, covering this right now, but boy, do I feel a responsibility and the privilege of being in that kind of a setting. So the media literacy part of it is real. The, the, other, the other part of it, and I know you and I have been through this on different topics together, but I have a real weakness as a presenter of information in a topic like this because I am a really easy crier. Yeah. Um, and it's like a cute thing about my personality. It's also a legit 
problem for doing my job sometimes. Um, I know other people, I mean, everybody's human. I know a lot of people in our business who get teary for a second and then can pull it back together. I get teary and it, sometimes I can't pull it back together. And the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but the, the human suffering and the sadism and the suffering of survivors um, who have, who are pining for their loved ones is something that I just have a very hard time even talking about in the abstract right now. And it makes it hard to do this, this story well because there's so much ter terrible and terrifying human behavior that is still very live as an issue um, and so many people in so much pain and we have to tell those stories and sometimes I am not great at it. That is why we love you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I just, you mentioned it, that I can close my eyes again and remember the night during family separations that you read that report of, about the tender age children. And I think everybody here can, I've got the chills talking about it. Uh, everybody here can remember that too. And uh, thank you for, for, for saying that and for being you mm. uh, in those moments. I wish I would have been able to get to the end of the sentence yeah. that night, you know, but thank you. Yeah. Um, I feel like every time you write a book, you say in some form, I'm never writing a book again. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely committed. No way. So what happened? <laughs> so, all right. I, um, it, around the 2016 election and it's, inter are we supposed to say alt-right anymore? Does the alt-right, is that still a phrase? I feel like we should have, we stopped using that. We never came up with a new one. But there was this thing that happened around the ascendance of Trumpism um, on the political right. Um, which everybody was covering, and all the, you know, all the ways that we do. But then there was this other thing that was seemed to be simultaneously spiking, which was um, much stranger to me, and it was virulent anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial specifically. Hmm. Um, why are these things going together? Holocaust denial is just a thing that I, of all the terrible things it is, I also find it just bizarre. Like how. I understand what it's used for, why people do it, but it is um, just a strange thing to try to convince people is a truly held belief, given the reality of the world. Um, and so I was, I, I sort of felt like this is something, these guys coming, you know, and, and the later iterations of it, right? Guys with swastika flags on the 405 and outside yeah. Disneyland in Florida and these neo-Nazi groups that are were marching in Ohio within the past week and have marched on the National Mall and all that stuff. Why are these guys coming back? At the same time, we're seeing this very interesting project on the political right. I think of these things as separate. And so I started looking at the origins, or trying to find what I thought would be an easy answer to the question of the origins of American Holocaust denial. And I'm st still working on that, actually, as a project, but I can trace it back as far as 1948, which is crazy if you think about who roamed the earth in 1948. The survivors, people who lost family members, perpetrators, people who had liberated concentration camps, including American GIs, photographers who had been there, American government officials who had coped with the aftermath and who had coped with what we knew about at the time. I mean, the number of people who could personally testify to the veracity of the Holocaust around in 1948, and that's when people are still trying to sell it? So, turns out it's never been based on a legit belief that the Holocaust didn't happen. It's always been part of an anti-democratic political project. Mm -hmm. And when I started to go down that path, I found the Great Sedition Trial of 1944, which I had never heard about before. And when I realized that those guys, these, are the, these 29 defendants were put on trial, it was the biggest sedition trial in US history. It lasted seven months. It ended with the judge dying. They all walked and then melted back into the sauce. I thought, oh, you know what? <laughs> what I was gonna work on, I think I'm gonna work on this. Um, and that became the Ultra podcast. And then I really, I wanted to write the book in part because I wanted to talk about some of those things I mentioned with Henry Ford. Um, the podcast is a narrow slice of this. I'm really interested in the fact that the forces that were on that side of the ledger ahead of World War II included the most influential people in the country. I am interested in the fact that it was Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh and the America First Committee was the biggest thing in American politics. I'm interested in the fact that 83% of Americans in 1940 did not want us to get into World War II. I mean, 
1940 is late in terms of what Hitler's already done at that point, right? So the, the size of the thing that my good guys were up against um, is something that I felt like is sort of a, a book-length argument rather than a podcast-length argument. But you also, I mean, you could have carried on with the project you were doing and then had this be the second project. What was the urgency for you to swap orders, uh, basically to go from this Holocaust denial project to what, altering what became prequel? In part because once I get a story stuck in my craw, I have to do it. <laughs> so learning the sedition trial story and learning that it wasn't just that I slept through history class that day, it's that <laughs> this isn't in anybody's history class, I just felt incredible urgency about getting that story told. So um, both because it's helpful, but also because I feel like, I mean, to, to tell you the truth, the, the primary source material on this um, story the primary source meaning archives, people's individual papers, you know, the, 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 the very first tier of material from people who lived through this stuff. That's all in exactly the places you would expect it to be. It's people's papers that have been filed in libraries, it's the trial transcript in the National Archives, it's all that stuff. But the secondary source material, which is people writing about it, it's like tiny little marginal corners of forgotten academia from decades ago and neo-Nazis. All the secondary source material on this stuff has been written by the very far right, because those are the people that are proud of this. Because they are proud at how influential they were, about how many big deal people and forces they had on their side, and they are proud of how close they got. And I do not want to leave this history to them. Um, in part because I don't want to make you go to those websites to read it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, your computer will never be the same. Um, and, am, am I right that you were doing a lot of this research, reading and research during and around the, the January 6th hearings? Yes. And so I mean, <laughs> you're watching the January 6th hearings play out as sort of pundits, other people, some people are saying, you know, these, are, these may end up being toothless hearings. There's not going to be consequences from these hearings. What did researching and reading about uh, this, your good guys, uh, make you feel differently, if at all, about watching January 6th hearings? It's a very good question, and it was a very potent thing for me, because one of the lessons of the Great Sedition Trial of 1944 and the Christian Front Sedition Trial in 1940 um, is that when you've got an anti-democratic, violent movement, whether or not it's tied to foreign authoritarian governments that are trying to overthrow our government, when you've got something like that to contend with, the things that they do that are crimes have to be prosecuted as crimes. Anytime you're using violence in a political context or violence in any context, it's a crime and it has to be prosecuted as such. And it is very hard to prosecute someone for sedition. If you think about it, almost by definition, it's hard to prosecute someone. Like, what's sedition? You're trying to overthrow the government. Well, if you are on trial, for trying to overthrow the government, that means you didn't succeed because the government is still there to put you on trial for trying to overthrow them. So by definition, you can argue, oh, it wasn't serious, it was never gonna succeed, I'm just a clown, why would you? So you need the Justice Department <laughs> to prosecute crimes and you also cannot count on the Justice Department to do everything. You cannot count on the criminal justice system to get all the way there. You need to do everything. And the thing that was actually most potent, I believe, against the ultra-right fascist movements that I'm writing about here in the lead up to World War II was not necessarily the prosecutions, although those had an effect. It was the activism and the journalism about them. It was people in their own time exposing what they were doing. Incredibly brave journalists, and people who were activists in the sense that they took it upon themselves to infiltrate these groups, to write up dossiers on what they were doing, to get it to law enforcement, to try to interest law enforcement on what they were doing, to bring civil lawsuits against these groups and between these groups to try to hamstring them and bankrupt them just the way that the Unite the Right groups, the Nazi groups that brought the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally to fore in 2017 were sued, <laughs> civil suits, in ways that were very important to the modern ultra-right. There's all sorts of things that needed to happen all at once. And it made me realize that the January 6th hearings, it was easy to say, oh, yeah, subpoenas, but they're just congressional subpoenas. They're not gonna get charges against these people. Oh, they're gonna make a referral to the Justice Department. What's the Justice Department gonna do about it? None of this is gonna go anywhere. What I know from this history is that exposing it 
getting the truth of it right, getting it down in an unassailable, fact checkable fashion so that this history cannot be unwritten, that's actually like 80% of the game. And exposing this stuff matters. It, including, and I'm going to get to this in just one second, here in LA, and some of the stories are truly, um, truly mind-blowing. But yeah. be before I do that, just one theme. There are several themes th that, that really resonated with me. Um, but one that presents itself, and you have been very clear, you said it tonight, that only Hitler is Hitler and only the Nazis are the Nazis. Yeah. Um, but everything old is new again. Um, in some measure. And America First Committee, you mentioned it was a Nazi organization, but today... Well, Nazi-inflected organization. It was a lot of things, okay. but yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it, it was a familiar refrain during the last administration. It's, Stephen, it's the name of Stephen Miller's organization, <laughs> political and legal, today. Literally, the name of his organization is America First Legal. Um, and then, the one to me that is just unbelievable is there is build a wall. Um, you have to read this story in the book, but if it's okay, I just want to read a little bit of yeah, it. Yeah, please. Um, I was shocked to learn about Senator Robert Rice Reynolds, a Democrat from North Carolina, who called for federal legislation to close U.S. borders to European Jews. And you write this, despite widespread knowledge by then that they were being rounded up and murdered by Nazis, he said they were going to be seeping into this country by the thousands every single month to take jobs which rightly belong to Americans. I wish to say, this is him, and say it without the slightest hesitation that if I had my way about it at this hour, I would build a wall about the United States so high and so secure that not a single alien or foreign refugee from any country upon the face of the earth could possibly scale or ascend it. When, when you come across these striking parallels between yeah. now and, and the characters and the stories of that time, um, how, how are you absorbing all of this? Uh, it makes me want to write history books. I mean, <laughs> I, there are, I mean so th among the far right members of Congress right now, some of them have proposed that they should define their movement currently in America today as Christian nationalism. Well, Christian nationalism taken as just a definition is a, should, should be troubling enough for anybody to hear that, but Christian nationalism is also a sort of a political term of art that was adopted by one of the guys in the book, Gerald L. K. Smith, who ran for president in 1944 on a proposal to deport all Jews from America. So he was, uh, you know, anti-mongrelization was his campaign. And that's who defined Christian nationalism within the last century. Um, to call yourself the America first anything um, means that you need to reckon with the previous uses of America first, including Gerald L. K. Smith had an America first party, um, America first incorporated, America first committee, uh, including, I mean, the, the, the very first Foreign Agents Registration Act, FARA prosecution in this country, um, was an America First officer from Ohio who was charged under the Farrah Act for being a Nazi agent because the Nazis were funding his work for America First in Ohio in the lead up to World War II. It just makes me, I mean, maybe the folks who are bringing these things back, build a wall and America First and all the rest of it, maybe they know the history and that's why they're doing it. There is a optimistic side of me. It's a very small side, it's more like a sliver that wants to believe that they don't know the history and if they learned it, they wouldn't do it. And the rest of us should at least learn the history so that we know what language they are speaking when they use those terms. Amen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk about LA. Uh, LA is as prominent a character in prequel as, as any person or any place. Yeah. Um, there's the Aryan bookstore, which it has literally sent me on a wild goose chase through. I, Rachel knows this because I emailed her about it. Uh, it has literally sent me on a wild goose chase through LA to like see the Nazi sites of Los Angeles, and they are there. Um, it was called the Aryan bookstore. The Who Aryan like, bookstore. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there, there is one in particular, though, that was uh, uniquely um, strange. And I'll ask you to tell the story in a minute, but I went, I went to this park in La Cañada that comes up in the story, uh, Hindenburg Park. It's not called Hindenburg Park anymore, but there's this part of the park that's called Hindenburg Park. 
And I was walking around at Hindenburg Park after having read the section of the book about Hindenburg Park asking unsuspecting local people, do you know where the Nazi plaque is? <laughs> <laughs> and I got, yeah, it was very awkward. Uh, You're lucky you didn't get punched. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. I found the Nazi plaque. Oh, good. And it tells the story of, um, of what happened in this park. And, and just the short version is there, are, there were 20 Jewish Angelinos who were going to be, the plot was, to, to, to hang them from yep. oak trees in this park. Um, and then shoot them full of bullets in what, what the, the organizer of this called a necktie party. Mm -hmm. Can you take us deeper into this plot, into Nazism in Los Angeles? Yes. And I will also say that um, among us here today is uh, Steve Ross, who's a professor at USC, whose book, Hitler in Los Angeles, is um, absolute required reading for any, if you haven't read Hitler in Los Angeles, just buy it before the week is out. You just, trust me, you will not, you will thank me for having read it. Um, and what, what Stephen Ross did, and another historian named Laura Rosenzweig as well, um, is that they found the files from Leon Lewis, who's an American hero who was running a private spy operation to get World War I veterans, many of them German-Americans, to infiltrate Nazi groups in Los Angeles and report on their doings and to bring news of what they were doing to law enforcement. And through Leon Lewis's spy reports, um, we learned about his infiltrators in groups like the American White Guard and the American Nationalist Party and the Silver Shirts in Southern California who were planning to um, kidnap and murder um, a number of prominent Jewish Angelinos to hang them, to shoot their hanging bodies full of bullets, to then invite newspaper reporters to come see what they had done. Um, and what they were hoping is that it would set off effectively uh, national pogroms. And we would have Dirk Tag, we would have the day of reckoning where Americans turned against Jews as if Jews weren't Americans. And um, there, was a there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of different elements of the plot that they put together. They thought about doing it in the immediate wake of the 1936 election. They thought that it, when FDR got reelected, disaffected, Americans who didn't want that outcome might be roused to more radical action, especially if they were told that, you know, the election had been stolen or that kind of thing. Um, the tr very troubling part of it, though, um, in addition to the kind of scale of what they were planning, is that it was a fairly well-funded effort. This was not just guys sitting around BSing. Um, and there is pretty good evidence that among the support for what they were doing was support that they were getting from the German consulate, which meant the Berlin government was helping. Um, and so thanks to the American hero, uh, Leon Lewis and his spies, thanks to Stephen Ross for teaching us about what Leon Lewis did, we know that that was sort of reported up the chain in local law, for, law enforcement, military intelligence, and federal law enforcement, and it was taken seriously more or less, mostly less. Um, but the exposure of these things help, is what helped, um, helped tear them down. Now, I will say Hindenburg Park did host its share of Hitler Youth gallery, the other gatherings. Yeah, it's on the plaque. Yeah. <laughs> it was a Hitler Youth summer camp, and it, literally Hitler Youth. Um, including burning swastikas and big, um, you know, parades of stormtroopers. Um, so Hindenburg Park was a center of the German-American Bund and other fascist and Nazi groups at the time. You, you mentioned um, sort of the response to Leon Lewis going around to, to different people and including law enforcement, um, trying to get any help that he could in yeah. the face of having these plots. And actually, Mr. Ro there's a great passage from Mr. Ross in the book um, in your book, where he's talking about he went to, to CSUN in Northridge to go through the archive of Leon Lewis's papers, uh, and he you know, was writing about how Leon Lewis has written a memo to file after meeting with the, the chief of the Los Angeles Police Department at the time. You say Chief James Two Gun Davis. Two Guns. He literally, <laughs> he would do pictures, right? He was, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> The chief of the LAPD responded to Leon Lewis by saying, you don't get it, 
Hitler's only trying to save Germany from the Jewish problem, and that the real threat is not from the Nazis and fascists, but from all those communists in Boyle Heights. Yeah. That was the, so law enforcement not exactly helpful. No, law enforcement not happily at the, happy at the not, not helpful at the local level. Law enforcement not happy at the federal level. I mean, what was the FBI interested in at this point? They were interested in the communist threat, and so all eyes left. And when Congress investigated un-American activities, these are the early days of the un-American activities committee, all they cared about was communists. All they cared about, cared about was the red threat, the red menace. And it was very awkward for them that these like goose-stepping fascists kept wandering into the frame. <laughs> um, <laughs> they really did not want to focus on them. So they would sort of do reluctant, every now and again, investigations. Um, relatively perfunctory investigations of, um, of the threat from the right. But this, this was a threat from the right that was it, was, it was stolen US military weapons, it was stockpiling bombs, it was plans to murder not just famous Jews in Los Angeles, but a dozen congressmen at a time. Mm -hmm. It was plans to set off enough sort of politically volatile bombings at once that the country would be put into a state of emergency and the National Guard would be called out and there were so many fascists in the National Guard that they would bring out their brethren from all of these fascist groups, the Christian Front and all the rest of them, and side with them and they would be the armed vanguard of the new military junta that would take over the United States because in a state of emergency, you can't go back to democracy, that's weak. I mean, this is, this is the stuff that we were contending with as a country, um, including street violence against random Jewish passersby and Jewish businesses in multiple cities all over the country. Um, I mean, there's a rally by the Christian mobilizers and the Christian front in the Bronx um, with 15,000 people there in an open air rally. And I know you've all heard about the Madison Square Garden rallies, America First Committee and other groups, German Day rallies where they've got they've got George Washington on one stanchion and they've got a swastika flag on the other. And I know we've all seen those images and heard about that, but imagine it open air in the Bronx, 15,000 people saying, Hall Hitler. Imagine living in the Bronx. Imagine going home from your third shift that night after that rally let out. That kind of street terror against American Jews in particular um, but also Americans who oppose them, Americans who are group, part of groups like Fight for Freedom that wanted us to get in and intervene in World War II and go fight the Nazis over there. There, was, there were vicious, and in some cases deadly, brawls between the fascist groups that were very well organized and connected to the cops and connected to the National Guard and people who were on the other side of it. To have violence intruding in the political space is one of the big red flags that you look for in a democracy that is a threat um, of falling to authoritarianism or fascism or other kinds of ultranationalist movements. When you can't do politics without being scared for your neck, mm -hmm. then politics isn't for normal people anymore, and you're on a slippery slope. It wasn't just the threat of, um, of explicit threat of violence, but there was, there was I mean, we talked about information sort of warfare today, misinformation, disinformation. Yeah. Um, there was this idea of, of snowstorming, and they would, they, there are leaflets, right? And they would not only paste them on um, telephone poles or pass them out in communities, um, they would throw them from the tops of buildings and literally let them fly all, out, all over the place so that people could pick them up. They were truly vile. And in, in LA, this was also happening. And, and in San Diego, too. Yeah. San Diego. I, um, when I read about it in the book, and I read about Mr. Ross going to the, the archive at CSUN, I went on Friday to the archive because I wanted to see some of this stuff um, for myself. Of course you did. Yes, thank you. It's, it's, yeah. um, it's awful. <laughs> yeah. It's awful. Um, but one of, the, one of the stories, one of the people that you talk about in the book is this guy, Henry Allen, a white supremacist, and he wrote in, in August of 1937 to Charles Slocum, who was sort of one of these, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the agents for Leon Lewis. Yes. Um, and what he wrote, what I saw, was that for $3.50, they could get a thousand, and they were called gummed paper, basically sticky paper. Um, flyers. Handles. Nazi flyers, yeah, that they were going to stick around town and put on people's walls and do whatever they wanted to do with them. 
the, sticky, the stickiness is still there. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can report on the files in, at CSUN. You can pick it up and you can hold it and you can experience it for yourself. And I know you, I know how you prepare. I've seen you in your office with papers all over the floor with your <laughs> highlighters out. Um, I am sure you have a, a stack of Nazi, many maybe, propaganda somewhere in your, uh, yeah. your archive. Yeah. What was it, I'm just curious, what was it, I know what it felt like to see the primary source material myself, it was crazy. What was it like for you to spend, I'm sure, a lot of time with that material? It, yeah, my office is a little shop of horrors. It is, <laughs> and you know, and also when you start buying stuff from this world, like in terms of just even just buying books, secondary sources and stuff about it, like ultimately you buy enough of them and then you start getting really weird ads, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and Susan and I, my partner and I share a Wi-Fi, and so she gets all those ads too, and she's like, I'm not even, <laughs> sorry, honey. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it does, the, the thing that I actually have found most jarring from the archives research is to go back to some of these incidents and these, these sort of touchstone moments, whether it was around the sedition trial, around other things here, um, or the Christian front arrests and that stuff, but you go back, and, you know, I talked to a lot of historians. We talked to a whole bunch of historians. Uh, Mike Yarvitz is here with whom I did Ultra, and Kelsey Desiderio, um, who are producers, producer on Ultra. Um, and we talked to a lot of historians for the start of this research. And to a one, like everybody knew some piece of it, but nobody knew all of it. And it really, the story hasn't sort of been told in full. At least I didn't feel like it had been told in full the way that I wanted to. Um, but you go back into the archives and you pick a date that you think, okay, I know this happened on this date, so let me look at the papers from the day after. And you go and you look at the papers and it doesn't matter what paper you look at in the country because it's a three inch headline on every newspaper in the country when it happened. Like the arrests of the Christian Front guys in January 1940, every paper in the country, headlines like this. And then you realize it's been completely forgotten. And that, I feel like for those of us in our business, it's like, oh good, humbling. Yeah. Remember that whatever today's news is may not be tomorrow's history if it doesn't fit a narrative that people want to tell about the history of their country and the history of their people. It, is, it feels great to talk about what we did in World War II abroad. It does not feel as good to talk about what we did ahead of World War II at home against the fascists who wanted for us what had happened to so much of Europe. But if you look at it, not just from the perspective of the guys who are producing those leaflets, but the people who were tearing them down, yes. or the people who are infiltrating those groups and getting the snowstormers arrested, that to me is a history that's very energizing because that to me is a whole group of people to study, to get ideas from about how to do this work uh, how to do this work effectively. Can you, can you talk, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about the tactics of Leon Lewis or John Raggi, who, who, while they were not able to necessarily, in the court of law, um, achieve the goal that I, I would imagine they set out to, um, you feel like, and you've been very clear about it, um, they're, they're heroes because of the way they did what they did. And their stick to -itiveness. Um, Both of those men who you just mentioned are not men who were rewarded in their day for what they did. They were not made heroes of in their lifetimes. Um, Leon Lewis's obituary doesn't yeah. mention the heroic work he did to save the country and to save Southern California from the threat that was very real and present here. Um, another one of the real heroes here is Henry Hoke, who was just a, literally an ad man. He was a guy who was a direct, his area of expertise was direct mail advertising, which does not sound like being a Marine, right? But he did incredible work but using his business expertise to trace the German propaganda plot back to its source. He's the one who really exposed to the country that and the, the, the Nazis' chief propaganda agent in the United States was using Congress to distribute millions of pieces of pro-Nazi propaganda in the United States. And he was able to figure it out because he recognized the way that address machine prints because that was his field of business. He was just a random citizen. He didn't know he was gonna be a hero, but heroism came knocking on his door and he answered, and it turns out he had incredible expertise to offer. So there is a sense in which um, the kind of regular, regular folks um, who found themselves 
either with just the right expertise or just the wrong timing or whatever it was, I find some of them the most inspiring stories here. There's a, there's a, a secretary um, who works in a senator's office, and I'm sure there are good things to say about this senator. I have not found any yet. Um, <laughs> This is Mr. Lundeen. Senator Lundeen yeah. of Minnesota. Um, one of the things that kind of makes me itch about him, in addition to all the other things he did, is that he ripped off his staff. So he's a senator. He's got a Senate staff. The Senate pays for X number of staffers at that time. And his staffers would get paid every week. And then he'd stand there and demand from them that they kick back to him some of their salary in cash. And that was what it cost to be, you know, to have the privilege of working in his office. Like, are you freaking kidding me? But it, you know, and a secretary working in that system. So working for him and powerless enough that she is being compelled to hand over part of her salary in cash every week to her boss. Nevertheless, when he is in a plane crash and his wife shows up at his office in the immediate wake of the plane crash and says, I need a specific file from my husband's office, and I need it now. And you have to give it to me, and I'm taking it away, and do not tell anybody I took it. She had the strength and the bravery to call the FBI and say, I work for Senator Lundeen, and we need you to know what was in that file. And that is a person who was not, again, you know, not, not suiting up to go fight Nazis abroad and not trying to be a hero, and yet did something that helped break that case open, that again, exposed this thing that Germany was doing to us that was very dangerous in our country. So these tactics, um, they are replicable to a certain degree. Like I think the Justice Department did learn a lot um, about what it did wrong in those eras. I think John Raggi, having lost the sedition case, essentially, well, having, having, having lost the opportunity con to convict any of his defendants when that trial uh, ended in a mistrial when the judge died. Um, you know, Raggi had stick to in terms of how he was going to try to tell the American people, nevertheless, what had happened. There's all, all sorts of things to learn there in terms of the way the government can do stuff. But the thing that I, the thing that impels me here, the thing that I wanted to write this book could, so it could have more of these stories in it and tell you more of these um, sort of human confrontations with this kind of evil is regular people doing extraordinary things when they definitely could not have prepared in advance. It was just, they had character, and the moment happened when their character made a difference for their country. And I want us to all be worthy of that, you know? Are there, um, are there analogs today with the, the, you know, these type of heroes that you came to learn about uh, pre-World War II? Do you look around, I've heard you talk about the example from Georgia, the election workers in Georgia. Yeah. Um, who else? Well, let's talk for a second about them, though, because that's, an, that's like a great in-between case. So Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss right. work, are poll workers in Georgia, um, and they're doing their you know, small part, uh, basically working temp jobs um, to work at the lowest level of how our democracy technocratically functions, and they become the object of this, um, uh, I'm just going to say evil, um, conspiracy theory that put their lives in danger, to the point where, I mean, people physically pushed their way into one of their homes. Um, they had to be moved for their safety. Um, at one point, Ruby Freeman was confronted by somebody who came to her and essentially inveigled their way to her through, um, um, through a series of lies. And she had the presence of mind to say, yes, I will meet with you to talk about this because what these lies that you've told me are interesting enough to me that I feel like maybe you're trying to help me. But she had the presence of mind to say, I will meet you only at a police station because she was that at risk. And she's right, she was right to have done that given the risk to her. And the thing about Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss is that they were subject to something unconscionable in terms of the way a democracy works. You cannot have people who are operating at that level of a democracy with zero protection subject to that kind of threat. And yet, they survived it, which itself is heroic, and then they testified publicly with their real names, not with anonymity. so that that truth could be told. 
it became part of that testimony and their willingness to explain what they went through became part of the criminal charges in Fulton County against some of the people who brought those intimidating mm -hmm. tactics to, to bear against them. But the other thing that they did, and don't sleep on this, is that they sued the bastards who did it. And that actually is one of the things that Leon Lewis did. He used the civil courts to bring these German-American groups, these pro-Nazi groups, d d into the court system where we've got you know, an evidence-based um, adversarial system of sorting things out in front of a judge to air out what they were doing, to get it in the newspaper, and to make them answer for it, and to make them have to answer for it under oath in a way that had consequences. And that matters. Again, it's not putting somebody in prison, necessarily, although in this case, maybe. Um, <laughs> But it is also being willing to say, you know what, as an American citizen, this is not just about me getting away from this, which actually I, I feel like that would be my instinct. As an American citizen, when you did this to me, you were doing it to try to take away our system of government. And I am not only going to survive it, but I'm going to make you pay for it. Mm -hmm. And they could only do that alone, and they did it. There ought to, there's going to be a statue to them someday if we do this right. Mm -hmm. Um, before we get to, to, I know there's a lot of questions that you guys have submitted as well, but the, one other, I mentioned one theme, uh, you know, everything old is new again. Another one that comes up at the end is the U.S. government's ability, or I guess um, it's almost a disease, to let bygones be bygones. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you write that, that it's not just... It's not just this story. It, you say it cuts across political parties. It's our long and continuing American tradition to carefully avoid reckoning for the grandest of American sins, especially when they involve alleged or actual illegal activity by government officials. Lincoln's malice towards none, towards the Confederate insurrectionists in the aftermath of the Civil War, Ford's full and unconditional pardon of Nixon after Watergate, Obama's reluctance to prosecute anybody uh, for systemized well lawyered torture practices during the post 9-11 wars. I'd like to also submit the lack of accountability around the prior administration's family separation policy. Yes. You know, you hear that you, we heard during the campaign, our, our current president call it criminal. We heard during his confirmation hearing, our current attorney general say it was shameful and he couldn't imagine anything worse. Yet everybody that, you know, was a part of that is still out um, and has faced no consequences at all. Yeah. How, how do you understand this phenomenon? How do you process that phenomenon? I think that we, are, we have a, a little bit of an awkwardness in our criminal justice system, which is that the Justice Department, I think by constitutional necessity, is an executive branch office, right? So the Attorney General is appointed by the President and is confirmed by the Senate and turns over with new presidents. And that is, I believe, a constitutional necessity in terms of the way we do things. But in addition to that, there needs to be independence of the federal Justice Department so that crimes, even by powerful people, are prosecuted as crimes, and that crimes that are committed for political reasons are not treated more lightly than crimes that are committed for more venal reasons. And that <laughs> is, it's a hard thing. I mean, before I did um, ultra, um, Yarvitz and I did Bagman, Bagman right? Yeah. Which is about the Spiro Agnew prosecution. And <laughs> had, had the Spiro Ag the, the where that lands is our hero prosecutors having resisted incredible political pressure to drop the case, nevertheless get it over the finish line. They've got a 40 count felony indictment to bring against the sitting mm. vice president of the United States. And what they end up agreeing to, against their will, is that he pleads no low to a single count, doesn't do a day in jail, but he has to resign. And the prosecutors, two to one, I have talked to them all about it, including recently, all thought that Agnew absolutely forgot, should go to jail. It was not tax evasion. It was, it was bribery and extortion, including taking envelopes stuffed with cash at his desk in the White House. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was really bad. They really wanted him to go to jail. And yet, 
all of them, 201, and I've spoken to all of them about this recently, believe that in the end that was the right compromise because the most important thing was to get that man out of office. Now, nobody else in the country could trade away their job for 40 felony counts. <laughs> but he could. And I, I defy you to find the clearest moral line through that story. And it is, it's hard. I mean, the, 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 I think the one thing that we can all agree on, having been through Spiro Agnew and now having been through Donald Trump, is that it is a good idea to not elect criminals to high office. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Because it puts us in an awkward position. It, it, it's hard. It's hard. And we need to protect prosecutors from Fulton County to Washington to everywhere else. We need to protect them from political pressure. I know just one. I know we have our audience questions, but I, just before that, I have one more question for you. I, yeah. One of the things that I, I, you know, read that Hollywood Reporter interview closely, and you said about the book, if you're worried we might not have another presidential election after the next one, there are stories to tell about other Americans who confronted that very real threat. Yeah. Is that a worry of yours? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not worried about it. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> we'll be back right after. Just the break. checking. <laughs> Yes, I am worried about that. All right. Yeah. All right. When I was 13 year old, the Watergate scandal sparked my interest in politics. What event, person, or idea inspired you to become a political nerd? I was a nerd before I was a political nerd. Um, <laughs> who's here? Who here's a nerd? Um, I did not have a native interest in politics growing up. Um, I grew up as a gay kid in the San Francisco Bay Area um, at the apex of the AIDS epidemic. And so uh, when I came out at age 16, it was 1989, um, and I worked in an AIDS hospice in Oakland. Um, and then I uh, joined ACT UP and was an AIDS activist, and that was my extent of my political interest, was working on trying to keep people I knew alive um, and being very confrontational in doing so. <laughs> um, and so I never really, I never really much, I wasn't, just wasn't that engaged with politics um, until I just became engaged in the news. So I did a doctoral degree in, um, uh, in, in political science, um, where I worked on some of the stuff that I had worked on as an AIDS activist. I worked on AIDS issues in prisons. Um, and that gets you kind of close to politics, but it's pretty liminal. Um, and, you know, I, th I feel like your times catch up with you sometime. You can't live through what we've been through in politics in the last 15 years and not, I think, have it become the center of your life. Um, not if you, not if you want to keep your eyes open. Hi, Rachel. What are you reading these days? Any recommendations? I'm telling you, the shop of horrors thing is real. <laughs> like, right now, I'm reading stuff translated from German. I'm just sorry. Um, and not in a good way. So, yeah, oh, I, I you know, I'm, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to say. But I'm working on, we're, Mike and I are working on Ultra Season 2. Kelsey's working on it as well. Um, and... I'm doing a lot of uh, contemporary work in terms of what the politics and news is of the day in order to get ready for this election. Um, in part because I, I do think, I mean, we had kind of a light exchange about it a minute ago, but I do think this next year is gonna be really weird. Um, and I do think that anybody who gets a major party nomination for president has a 50-50 chance of becoming president. And so if the Republicans are gonna nominate former President Trump, um, alongside all of his legal drama, I do think that it's gonna become pretty overt what the stakes are, what, what the two different candidates are offering. And it's not policy choices that Democrats like versus policy choices that Republicans like. Um, we have, like, the whole dashboard is flashing red lights right now in terms of holding on to our democracy. And if we get the nominees it looks like we're gonna have for the two major parties, it's gonna be a really weird year because the stakes for the election are going to be whether or not we have another election. And um, I just, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to stay healthy and stay on the ball and uh, keep my eyes open. 
What generation do you think will have the biggest impact on the 2024 election? What generation? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, the generation that I'm most hopeful for um, in terms of what's going to happen to us as a country in the long run is um, the generation younger than both of us that has made climate um, their, focal, their, their North Star. Because if America is going to do right by ourselves in terms of climate, it is going to be because we get right on that issue and then we can lead the world on that issue. And to have a generation um, coming up right now that is uncompromising, clear-eyed, creative, and energized on that issue is going to require the U.S. government to answer to them, which is going to show that the democratic system of government that we have in this country can do stuff and is going to assert American leadership in the biggest problem the world has ever faced. So broad picture, um, the kids in your life, or the kids who are your life, um, who are really being incredibly pushy on climate right now, those are the kids who are going to save the country and save the world and save democracy in the process. Um, in terms of this next election, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I believe that I, you know, some people I feel like in our business look at the demographics of who votes the most and they say like, oh, old people, they all vote. Like that's a bad thing about Is that old a people. Steve Kornacki impression. Oh, yeah, exactly. I can't pull off the khakis, but yeah. No, there's something about like we all like, consider it to be baked in in terms of what older people's vote is going to be. Yeah. But I also feel like older people in America, yes, they vote in great numbers, and they have the longest experience on Earth to know how bad things can be. Hmm. Um, and so, to the extent that we've got really high stakes in this next election. It is easier for me to talk to somebody in their 70s or 80s about how American democracy is not inevitable and we need to take the worst prospects here seriously than it is for me to talk to somebody my own age or younger. And so I know everybody says, like, put your faith in the kids. I do for really big picture things. But I also put my faith in our grandparents um, and to those of you who have the most to tell us about how to live in this life and how bad things can be when they go really wrong. Do guests on your show know what questions you're gonna ask on air? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, with, with, a very few, with very few exceptions, the answer is no. But I'll tell you, there, the exception is if I am bringing on a reporter who is covering a live news event, for example, Jacob in Iowa, um, and I am curious about something, um, and I'm going to ask you live about it, and you don't know, or, like it's something literally like, I'm reporting from a different part of Iowa, you idiot. Like, if that, you know, that's not necessarily a conversation we want to know in the air. Um, but, also, but also, if it is something, that, the thing that I try to be particularly sensitive to is if somebody knows something that is not yet reportable. So that can put people in a really awkward position. So a lot of times in our news gathering process, we know something on background or we know something that we believe is probably going to become reportable once we get more than a single source on it, but it is in process and it cannot yet be said. If it's something, particularly something hot that people really want the answer to, for me to put a reporter on the spot, knowing that they know something but they can't yet say it is just an unfairness. And so that's a sort of territory that I would cover in advance. But that's something that happens you know, with, with our own reporters, occasionally with reporters from other news outlets, but it's, a, it's kind of a, almost like a technical thing to be respectful of people and not put them in a dangerous position with sourcing. Thank you for doing that. Yes. <laughs> Is there precedence for the FCC to regulate the words news and journalism as trade terms and thereby restrict or qualify their commercial use without running afoul of the First Amendment? <laughs> the best First Amendment lawyer in the country is sitting in the front row. Um, no. no. Okay. The answer is no. <laughs> uh, Ted Boutros is here who has gotten a lot of media organizations out of a lot of malicious uh, lawsuits uh, on, the base, on First Amendment grounds. Um, and uh, I, I would defer to my counsel in that regard. Yeah. I have time for two more questions. Have you found the work-life balance you were searching for? Will there be a time when we see you on five days a week? Um, 
I touched on this a little bit more. Yes, my, I'm, I'm better, thanks. Um, <laughs> I am back from the dead. Um, but like Pet Cemetery, I came back with a worse personality. Um, um, <laughs> happy Halloween! Um, no, I, I, am, I mean, listen, part of, part of it was just actual physical falling apart. Um, but part of it is also my brain. Like, I found myself having, facing the same length deadline every day for that many weeks, for that many years. I felt like I was thinking shorter thoughts. Um, and I found myself reading shorter sources. And I don't want my brain to be in a box. Um, and so part of the freedom that I wanted was to think in terms of, you know, scripted projects and movies and long-form podcasts and books and these things, both so that I could read longer things but also think longer thoughts and make longer arguments um, with more nuance and more depth. And that's, I needed that to kind of unsprain my brain and I am definitely there. Um, Susan will tell you that I'm not working any less, which is a, <laughs> not the deal that we made. Um, <laughs> So I'm trying to work on the balance in that regard. I'm trying to regain my sense of compartmentalization so that I work five days instead of seven days, which is so far not working. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in great shape and I will keep this job as long as they let me. Thank you, thank you. Final question. We all tend to seek out news sources and opinion sites that reflect our own biases. So sadly, I feel for the most part, curiosity about other opinions get lost in this. The outlets we side with financially thrive on this. I blame this on cable television, now also social media. How do you feel about that? And is there a solution? You know, this is, a, this is an answer who, th that you may find dissatisfying. But I just add a fundamental, You'll find it dissatisfying because it doesn't reflect any special knowledge from having been inside the media business. Um, and so just speaking as a person who is also a consumer of news, I, I believe that um, everybody can change. And I believe that the American public is capable of absorbing information that is true and complex and nuanced. And I believe that if, you've, if you're a good enough storyteller, a good enough expository storyteller, you can bring people all the way through in one sitting to graduate school level understanding of important topics, as long as you all start together in kindergarten. <laughs> and I just believe that we are capable of rational um, discourse. I believe that we are capable of emotional growth. I believe that even people who you might write off today as the worst people among us, bent on the worst projects that you can imagine for our country and our people, I believe that those people can change. They can see the light. They can have a conversation that makes them see things in a different way. And so I don't think when I'm doing any kind of storytelling, any kind of explaining, that the people who are listening to me already agree. I assume that I am meeting you where you are. Um, and it's, it's less that it's been proven in life, although it sometimes has been, and more that I have to believe it as a matter of my own faith. No matter what any of us does in life, we are all capable of repenting and being redeemed. Always, until the last moment you're on earth. And so why wouldn't you speak to people offering the best that you have to offer, offering them the best argument, the, the, the best explanation of the facts, the most generous expectation of them in terms of what they can morally and rationally absorb. You never know who you might move in any one moment. And I think that's true in life. I think it's true in terms of my faith understanding. And I think it's true in the news. Just talk to people like adults. If somebody throws spit wads at you, don't throw them back. You never know who you'll move. We love you in LA. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you guys you. for coming as well. Thank you.